Nine hikers dead. The pathologist rules that six of the hikers died as a result of hypothermia after hours of exposure to sub-zero temperatures. The other three hikers died of internal hemorrhaging. Yuri Doroshenko is one of the six hikers whose cause of death was listed as hypothermia. However, he also had multiple bruises and a swollen upper lip. In addition, his ear, nose, and lips were covered with blood, and an x-ray revealed pulmonary edema and a pulmonary contusion. Georgie was found next to Doroshenko. His cause of death is listed as hypothermia as well. He's also found to have bitten off a piece of his own knuckle and to have the tip of his nose missing, likely from animals post-death. He too has myriad abrasions and bruises and third-degree burns on his left leg and foot. The expedition leader, Igor Dyatlov's cause of death, is also listed as hypothermia, and he was vomiting blood before he passed away. Like the others, he has many abrasions and bruises. Zena has a large baton-shaped bruise on her waist, and her cause of death is also listed as hypothermia. Rustik Slobodan had a severe skull fracture, but his ultimate cause of death is listed as hypothermia. Layuda Dubanina is found missing her tongue and eyes. She has multiple broken ribs and her nose cartilage is broken and flattened. Her death is due to a massive hemorrhage in her heart's right atrium, multiple broken ribs, and internal bleeding. She's estimated to have died 10 to 20 minutes after sustaining the trauma. Sasha Zolotarov is also found missing his eyes. He has an open wound on the right side of his skull and multiple broken ribs on one side of his chest. Like Layuda, he has hemorrhaging into the cardiac muscle and pleural cavity. Alexander Kolovatov has a broken nose, an open wound behind the right ear, and a snapped neck. Nikolai Thibault Brignol has multiple fractures to his temporal bone on the right side of his skull. There's also a bruise on his upper left lip and a hemorrhage on the lower forearm. So why did these nine healthy, extremely fit young adults flee their only shelter without their boots into a pretty much pitch black night with a temperature of at least 25 degrees below zero. Why did they suddenly drop whatever they were doing to exit the tent in the same way people flee burning buildings? Whatever spooked them was such that they felt they needed out of the warm shelter and they took off in mere seconds, some even ripping their way out of the tent. Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T, and this is the fifth episode of the Dyatlov Incident, and it is called What Really Happened to the Hikers. Today, we're going to talk about the theories that have been put forth over the decades in an attempt to solve this mystery. In episode four, we ruled out an attack by the indigenous Manzai tribe. This was because the nearest Manzai settlement was 60 miles away from where the hikers were staying on the night of February 1st, 1959. Also, the Manzai tended to stay away from this particular mountain where the tent was erected because it was bare of trees and there was little hunting to be had there. It also did not hold any religious or sacred value to them, and there was no physical evidence to suggest the Manzai were there. In addition, the Manzai are a historically peaceful people. So let's move on to theory two. High winds. Igor Dyatlov had been warned about the extremely strong winds in the area by the forester, but had chosen to ignore that information. This idea of high winds was considered by investigators 
back in 59. Here is how they thought it might have gone down. Maybe two of the hikers were outside the tent on February 1st when whatever event happened, either getting their tent fully secured to the slope or perhaps attending to nature's call. Suddenly, they were overpowered by an incredibly strong wind that took them by surprise and pushed them down the slope. Their cries made the other hikers exit the tent to try and save them. The problem with this theory is that it assumes all of the seven other hikers would be willing to risk their own lives by putting themselves outside in the path of those same winds. Wouldn't the remaining hikers, or at least some of them, have said, no, I'm not going out there and I'm not gonna risk my life. But even if all seven hikers said, yes, let's all go, you'd think at least one of them would have put their boots on, especially since they were well aware of the below zero temperatures outside. The wind would also have to have been so powerful that it could blow all the hikers down the mountain, yet not so strong and blow off Rustik Slobodan's hat, which was still on his head when he was found frozen in the snow. According to the original investigators, the wind was very strong that night, as much as 40 miles per hour, but it was not hurricane force. A hurricane force wind is 74 miles per hour or higher, so this wind theory doesn't really work. Theory three, armed men. Some have theorized that a group of armed men, either from the Soviet military or from one of the prisons in Siberia led the hikers to their deaths. This theory was considered by the original investigators, especially because of the slashes made to the rear of the tent. However, once it was discovered that those slashes were made from the inside out, this theory became less credible. Also, there were only nine sets of footprints in the snow near the tent, one set for each of the hikers. No other tracks or footprints were seen. And further, there were no reports of escaped prisoners from any of the surrounding prisons, and the closest prison was 50 miles away. And we have to remember this is 1959 Russia near the remote Ural Mountains. There are no roads here, there aren't any snowmobiles to enable people to get to the hikers quickly. Here, people needed to hike, cross-country ski, or wear snowshoes. Now, some items were taken from the tent, which led people to speculate that the hikers were robbed, then hurt. This was because there was some missing chocolate, believe it or not. However, that was most likely eaten by the searchers who first found the tent. I'd probably eat the chocolate too if I came upon it. Two of them later confessed that they drank the hikers' flask of medicinal alcohol. Thus, it's likely they also ate the chocolate. Theory 4. Weapons Testing. Another theory is that maybe the Soviet military was conducting rocket or weapons tests in the remote area. Strange light orbs were reported as being seen in the sky near the northern Ural Mountains in February. Were those light orbs some type of military weapon being secretly tested? The problem with this is that the sightings of these orbs occurred in mid-February, not at the beginning of the month. One hiker named Georgi at Monarchy had originally told investigators he saw the orbs during the first week of February, but his hiking companion, who was on the same trip, later confirmed that the date on which they saw the orbs was February 17th. And this matches what other witnesses in Evedale reported seeing in the sky on that same day. Numerous witnesses said they saw these light orbs on February 17th and then again on March 31st. And they happened within minutes of corroborated rocket tests that were occurring at the Baikonur testing site, which is also known as the Soviet Missile and Space Station. And the final photo of Georgie's camera, Georgie who played the mandolin, that showed an unknown light source. Some have interpreted this to mean 
the nine hikers encountered either weapons testing or UFOs. It's impossible to determine what the light source is. It's also possible the photo was taken by accident. We'll never know. Because radiation was detected on some of the hikers' clothing, many take that as proof that weapons, in particular nuclear weapons, may have exploded above or near the hikers' tent. Perhaps that's what drove the hikers from their shelter, caused their injuries, and messed with their vision. We know from the autopsies that two sets of the hikers' clothes tested two to three times higher than normal for radiation. However, an associate professor of radiology at the University of Chicago Medical Center determined that by today's scientists' understanding of radiation, the levels cited in the investigators' notes were nowhere near the abnormal range. They would have needed to be 50 to 100 times the level detected to reach dangerous levels of radiation. The slight radioactivity of the hiker's clothing could be explained by environmental contaminants. For example, radiation from nuclear tests conducted that winter on the islands of Novaya Semle, which is 850 miles north of where the hikers were staying. Radiation could have made its way to the northern Urals through the atmosphere. The hikers' dark and orange skin, which was seen in autopsy and by the families, is logically explained as a severe tan or sunburn rather than radiation exposure. Before they were buried under inches of snow, the bodies likely laid out for days on end. Even if the sun wasn't out, UV rays would have made it down to them. Theory 5. An Avalanche When Russian authorities re-examined the Dyatlov case in 2019, they concluded that an avalanche was primarily responsible for the nine hikers' deaths. However, that theory, which was initially proposed back in 1959, doesn't completely make sense. The hiker's tent was on a slope with a very mild incline. The slope wasn't steep enough to make an avalanche a likely possibility. And in fact, there are no records of an avalanche ever occurring on that particular mountain, and no avalanches have occurred there since the hikers' deaths. Note that when searchers came upon the tent back in 1959, it was still standing, still firmly rooted to the slope. Had an avalanche occurred, it would most likely have taken the students and their tent with it. In addition, there was no snowfall on the night of February 1st that could have increased the weight of the snow on the mountain and triggered an avalanche. However, there were very strong winds, so it is possible that the wind could have carried snow from up on the mountain down toward the tent and thereby increased the snow load on the slope. Some people believe that the students, by cutting into the snow on the slope to create a spot for their tent, somehow triggered a delayed avalanche. So they cut the snow, as you can see in the photo, and then about nine hours later, the avalanche perhaps occurred. When computer simulations were done, they showed that the avalanche would not have been a huge one. Instead, it could have been maybe a block of ice that was perhaps 16 feet long and about the size of an SUV. Could such a heavy slab have caused the blunt force trauma that the three hikers sustained. The researchers' computer models did show that a 16-foot-long block of heavy, hard snow could break the ribs and skulls of people sleeping in a tent, and the injuries would have been severe but not fatal, at least not initially. That would explain how the hikers were able to flee into the darkness and make it more than a mile away from the tent. Now, this would have been a rare event, and it would have required the tent 
to be at a precise spot at a precise moment on that very windy winter's night. But to play devil's advocate, usually victims of avalanches die of asphyxiation, not hypothermia and blunt force trauma. Could the hikers have cut themselves out of the tent, which would have been under the weight of that big snow slab, and then fled in fear and panic more than a mile away from the tent? And did the hikers who were capable of doing it drag their injured comrades out of the tent to a safer area in an attempt to save their lives? Bruce Tremper, the director of the Forest Service Utah Avalanche Center, author of Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain, an all-around avalanche expert, reviewed the data and concluded this, and I quote, it is highly unlikely that an avalanche hit the hiker's tent or surrounding area. Tremper made that judgment based on the gentle height and angle of the slope. Personally, I think we have to keep the possibility of an avalanche on the table, but there's another theory that is also compelling. Theory six, could this tragedy have been triggered by atmospheric infrasound. The theory is that sound waves travel through the air at frequencies below those on the audible spectrum. Infrasound is the opposite of ultrasound. It occurs below the threshold of human hearing at 20 hertz. Ultrasound frequencies fall above hearing at a threshold of 20,000 hertz. Infrasound is a low status sound, meaning that it occurs below the lower limit of human audibility. Humans typically cannot hear it. Hearing becomes gradually less sensitive as frequency decreases. Thus, for humans to perceive infrasound, the sound pressure must be very high. We normally sense low sounds through our ears. However, at higher intensities, it is possible to feel infrasound vibration in various parts of our bodies. The Russian-born French scientist Vladimir Gavro studied the biological effects of infrasound on the body. In the 1960s, Gavro and his assistants suddenly started experiencing nausea, pain in their eardrum, and lab equipment that was shaking. There didn't seem to be an obvious cause for all of this. Gavro ultimately concluded that inaudible, low-frequency sound waves were being generated by the motor of a large fan and duct system in the building where the laboratory was housed. Gavro wrote that he and his assistants were suffering from the pressurized effects of infrasonic frequencies pulsing through their eardrums. The low frequency waves were causing their eardrums to vibrate the hair cells of the inner ear. So although the sound was not audible to people, the hair cells in the inner ear were sending impulses to the brain. Such a disconnect between the silence of the room and the brain getting signals from the ear was very disruptive on the human body. Man-made sources of infrasound like cooling and ventilation systems and wind farms can cause people to experience unpleasant symptoms. Nature, too, can also create low-frequency sound waves after earthquakes, landslides, meteors, storms, and tornadoes. Apparently, when incredibly fast winds encounter something obstructive in the landscape, it can lead to infrasounds that are highly disruptive to humans, leading to things like nausea, severe illness, even psychological symptoms. There was a study done in 2003 in London where 750 people were asked to sit through four contemporary pieces of music. Unbeknownst to the audience, two of the pieces included infrasonic sound waves. Afterward, the people were asked for their reactions to each piece of music. 165 people said that they experienced body chills and strange feelings of uneasiness, sorrow, nervousness, revulsion, and fear during the pieces 
with the infrasonic waves. 22% reported accelerated heartbeats or a sudden memory of an emotional loss. Some experts believe that some people are naturally more sensitive to the effects of infrasonic waves than others. In Taos, New Mexico, there's something the locals call the Taos hum. Google it. It's described as a mysterious droning and buzzing sound that only some hear. The hum causes the people who hear it an incredible amount of discomfort. Some have been driven to do themselves in to escape the hum. In Israel, the government has been known to use infrasound for crowd control. In the 1959 criminal case files for the Dyatlov hikers, a local from Ivdel described the weather near the northern Urals as follows. In winter, in the northern Ural Mountains, and even in the summer, there can be strong winds and sometimes whirlwinds. During whirlwinds, various sounds arise in the mountains, terrifying and foreign, like the howls of animals or human moans. You get scared when you're there, and those who haven't heard anything like that can become frightened. End quote. The mountain where the hikers were perched on a slope in anticipation of summiting nearby Ortoten Mountain, has a dome-shaped symmetrical top. That dome shape, combined with its close proximity to the hiker's tent, would have created ideal conditions for something called a Carmen Vortex Street. A vortex is a mass of whirling fluid or air. Simply put, the very windy weather on February 1st, 1959, in the northern Urals, combined with the landscape of the mountain where the tent was pitched, could have led to a Carmen Vortex Street. And that is a repeating pattern of swirling vortices. Imagine a wind shear caused by friction with the surface of the mountain. The wind shear increases its height as it travels up one side of the mountain. As it moves upward, it rolls up to create a horizontal roll vortex. As the horizontal roll vortex travels over the mountain's dome, it lifts upward in the middle and strengthens into a pair of vertical vortices. As the two vortices come down the other side of the mountain, one passes on one side of the hiker's tent, and the other passes on the other side. The two vortices would have produced frightening sounds as loud as a freight train and terrifying sensations that would have made the ground below the tent, as well as the hiker's chest, vibrate. The sides of the tent would have been flapping like crazy. Something that visceral could have led the freaked out hikers to literally tear out of the tent for fear of their lives. It might even have felt to them like an earthquake. As the hikers ran in the pitch black cold down the slope, they would not have been able to see what was in front of them. Could this explain why some of the hikers had blunt force injuries. The ravine in which some of their bodies were found had a precipice on one side that was 24 feet high. Is it possible that when those hikers were fleeing in the total darkness, they came upon the ravine from that precipice and fell 24 feet into the ravine? There were rocks at the bottom rocks that could have come in contact with the hikers' bodies. A fall like that could cause skull fractures, broken ribs, and internal hemorrhaging. But what about Layuda's missing tongue? While her body was out in that ravine from February 1st until early May, and the snow where she was found was slushy and wet, it is possible that the tongue broke down due to natural decomposition 
It's also possible that small animals got to it. There are also microfauna in the slush and water, and they could have helped decompose the fleshy parts of her body. Perhaps that's why her eyes and those of Sasha, who was also found in the ravine, were missing. In the end, I personally am caught between an avalanche scenario or this strange vortex phenomenon and infrasonic sound waves. Both events would have elicited fear and the desire to escape the confines of the tent. If the hikers' minds were affected by the howling and vibrations of the wind, and if fear eclipsed logic and reason, all of this could have led Doroshenko, Georgi, Igor, Zina, Rustik, Alexander, Sasha, Kolya, and Layuda to flee the sanctuary of the tent in an instant without grabbing their boots. What do you think? Which theory makes the most sense? I can't help having my only if thoughts. If only they could have survived the below zero temperature long enough for the sun to rise. If only some of them didn't perhaps fall into that rocky ravine. If only Igor Dyatlov had heeded the forester's warnings about the winds near Ortoten Mountain. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.